Hello, thank you for joining us uh, on the uh, New Review of Film and Television Studies uh, YouTube channel, uh, presumably. Uh, my name is Ryan Engley. I am a uh, assistant professor of media studies at Pomona College, and I have recently written an article uh, that will be uh, published uh, probably in the link to this episode on bo- the topic of bottle episodes, uh, the television series community, and the German philosopher Hegel. Uh, and threading all of these things together uh, with me will be uh, my friend and uh, podcast co-host uh, every two weeks for the last almost six years, Todd McGowan. Todd, uh, why don't you say hi and explain yourself to the listener? Thanks, Ryan. My name is, as Ryan said, my name is Todd McGowan. I teach it in the, I teach film actually at the University of Vermont in the Film and Television Studies program. And I've taught here for a long time and I've written a few books on film I haven't actually written anything on television, although I talked on television, I've taught on television. I do not have an article in this journal, unlike Ryan, but I'm going to try to <laughs> facilitate his uh, a discussion of his article alongside of him. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're super excited to do this. This is one of my favorite things to talk about um, because uh, television... Uh, tell I love television. I love television probably in a way that uh, is is uh, is is vulnerable and embarrassing. I think is how I would uh, describe the way that I love TV. There, uh, I don't know if I've told you this before, uh, Todd, or if it's come up on our podcast. But when um, when Lost was on, my whole my family we loved this series so much. And um, at the it was toward the end of the second season. I was graduating high school, and um, my girlfriend at the time asked me to uh, have dinner just because she was graduating too with her family. And we didn't really like, we didn't really do stuff like that. Like that was like, that's like a very like official and yep. formal thing to do. Yep. Right. And I said like, Oh wow. I would, I would love to love to go out to dinner with you and your family. Uh, when? And she said, uh, uh, she said like Thursday at eight. And I just immediately was like, I can't do that. Loss is on. <laughs> 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 and, and that relationship didn't last much longer. It didn't last. Uh, that was the, that was a sign that it should not have <laughs> lasted, right? <laughs> exactly. I uh, yeah, it was. I, I don't like telling that story in any way that that is uh, favorable to me because that is a, a uh, uh, that's a that's a terrible thing to do. Um, no, obviously. I don't think so. I think uh, what was well, she doing asking you to go to dinner on the night lost was completely. <laughs> that's just you know. Yeah, I once, what it. I have a similar television story. So my, okay. my, uh, so this is, okay, this is the original Battlestar Galactica. So not a great oh, yeah. television yeah. show, but we sure. were, we were visiting out of town. So it, like we, we lived in Ohio, we were visiting these friends in Virginia mm-hmm. and they had this whole nice dinner for us. And mm-hmm. my dad goes, um, can we take our plates into the living room and watch Battlestar Galactica? <laughs> And so me and my brother and my dad took our plates, went into their living room. I mean, I was younger, so I had an excuse, but he didn't have an excuse. Uh, yeah. and, and my mom was like, she was furious. But I thought that's a proper dedication to a... Yes. Plus he he knew, I think, that that show was going to be canceled after a year. So um, he had to get in the the watching of well, it. But I, I, your I law mean, story is better, but... Is, well, maybe. I mean, like the the thing that the thing that's really funny, like so. Your dad, and, and I mean, this is like one of the uh, one of the aspects of TV that that is um, in one of the shows that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about Star Trek today. Um, that the pervading sense that it can be taken away, like at any time. Yeah. And so there was. So it gives it gives the series itself a a, a, a life to it that you know. I don't want to say that we've lost because I don't want to say there should be a nostalgia for that. Like writers should have like uh, greater assurances, uh, especially in a time of a writer's strike um, and guarantees like of like what, what a show is going to do and the rug shouldn't be pulled out for them. But like your dad was properly reading the, like the existential stakes of a show like that, that it could just and and would have been taken away. Uh, For me, we totally had DVR. I could have watched that show. Oh, you could have watched it, but you needed to see it. It's like a, it's like a sporting event, right? Like you're not going to, you don't want to watch the Super Bowl on tape. I mean, that's, you're being very kind to me. So I appreciate all the support, but yes, it was a jerk thing for me, but I just, we, we, we throw this out here to talk about the sort of like the emotional investment. Yes. uh, I think that we both have in uh, television. And I think that is something that's at the core of the bottle episode. So if this is the first time that you've ever heard this phrase before a bottle episode, uh, what does it mean? And uh, it refers to a television series episode that is uh, closely uh, contained usually uh, constraints at the level of time and space uh, and 
it is confined as though bottled. Okay. Why, why that? How do we, how do we get there? So there's like a little bit of a history here and it's not a linear one, just like a lot of things, uh, in, uh, in television and media. Um, so, uh, Leslie Stevens, who is the producer of, uh, the outer limits, uh, which was an anthology, uh, science fiction series. So it's kind of interesting that this phrase, as we're going to see, came from, uh, a series where there was no, uh, narrative material really that carried from one episode to the next. Right. Uh, but he, uh, called a, an, an episode called a, a controlled experiment, which was a cheaply made and very quickly produced. He called it a bottle show. Like he was like a, like a genie pulling, pulling it out of a, pulling it out of a bottle. Right. Like a, uh, yeah. So that, right. that's, that's what he said. The exact quote is he pulled an episode right out of a bottle, like a genie. That's what he said. Cause they had very little money and v- they had very little time to do it. And what's sort of interesting is the economic, constraints and demands of the episode itself often ends up in the narrative. So because the episode has to be quickly made uh, and there is not a lot of, uh, you know, not a lot of time to do it. That's what ends up being in the show itself. And so do you think, uh, can I ask you a question about this? Do you think that, cause there, if you, if you try to look up the, how the history of the bottle episode, how we even got the term, Oftentimes they'll say, oh, it comes from Star Trek and it's the, it's the Mm. idea of a ship in a bottle, right? Like you put like this, this build a model of a ship inside a bottle. And Mm -hmm. I wonder if, I understand that that's not the origin of the term, but I wonder if the sustained viability and popularity of the term isn't due also to that second use of the second incarnation of the bottle episode. Yeah. I think, I think that it is. Uh, You do. do. I think. Okay. I do. Yeah. Because it had to be, I mean, so yeah, so Todd, um, so Todd, uh, uh, jumps, jumps ahead a few years to, uh, to Star Trek. I mean, why did it happen to these sci-fi shows? Yeah. Because for, for, for a couple of different reasons is that like they were considered to, you know, at the time to have like more marginal, uh, audience appeal. So they didn't have, uh, as big budgets as, as other things, but also because they were science fiction, you have, you're literally making things up like the, but they're also make more up. costly. I mean, that, Exa- that, that's what actually Exa- killed Star Trek. Probably it was how much it cost to make an episode. Exactly. Right. Don't you think that the yeah. cause special effects were, I mean, now they're cheap, but they used to be very expensive. They did. Yeah. And now, and you know what it's, I think it's, it's, it's a, a, a border, borderline insulting that like when you watch uh, Star Trek now on like Paramount plus, like all the uh, effects have been redone. And it's, uh, so I don't know how I, I'm pretty sure on the DVD version of it, or even the Blu-ray, you can see the original special effects, but like it's, you can tell these things have been uh, done ad hoc, uh, more recently. And like, and, and so what we're anyway, what we're and also, I'm sure very cheaply, you know, like, yeah, yeah, very like, cheaply, like yeah. where, where as cheaply at. as so possible, right? As cheaply as possible. So the, the issue with the bottle episode, it was a, a, a form of TV that arose because of, uh, economic demands. And like you had more money. I mean, this is still the case, but it was much more the case for uh, television in the U S in the fifties and sixties, like up, up through the, up through really more recently now where you have a TV show recently, like game of Thrones where they're doing like 10, $14 million an episode. Like, like, uh, and they're not really financially what, constrained is what you're not saying. Not financially constrained. And the constraint, right. I don't know. I, I think oftentimes now it doesn't pre-exist the episode. It's like, what does it take for the episode to do? So TV yeah. shows, of course, had uh, a, they always have a budget and you have more money available for a premiere and for uh, a finale and for sweeps weeks episodes. Uh, than you would for any episode in between. So this is the other financial part is that funding would become bottlenecked. And oh. that, yeah, and that, so this whole thing, right? You have the genie pulling it, pulling it out like a genie in a bottle, uh, like this, 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 this kind of magical thing that, that uh, uh, this almost Im- arose impossibly. You have this financial thing uh, of funding becoming bottlenecked. And then you have, of course, the Star Trek thing, which there is a, it, it's the original series, the ship in a, these ship in a bottle episodes, right. but this is referenced by Star Trek, the next generation, which literally has an episode called ship in a bottle, which is a bottle episode. So it's referencing that earlier thing. So this is how we got here. You have absolutely as a, uh, as a listener uh, of this, you have absolutely seen a bottle episode, whether you heard the name before or not. Uh, you have, uh, you know, uh, Lucy and I love Lucy. She got stuck in a meat locker two times. So if you've seen either of those, uh, then that's, you know, that's, that's your typical thing. Uh, characters being locked into some, uh, setting for one 
reason or another. And it's because why you don't have money f- to build new sets. You can't really get guest actors. You can't have new costumes, all these things. The, the, uh, the goal as, a uh, um, as TV tropes put it is to take up as little money as possible. That's uh, that's sort of the idea, but this, my claim, uh, doesn't really get into what is aesthetically, uh, important or even, uh, philosophically and existentially like at stake in these episodes. Um, more recently TV shows have been choosing to do, um, bottle episodes. We're going to talk about, uh, like not for funding reasons, but to play with the form and, uh, this like community as a television series that like to play with the form of the bottle episode, but even animated series like, uh, Bojack Horseman, the really famous episode, uh, where he is in a underwater world. The name of the episode is fish out of water. And he, uh, has all of his vices taken away from him. He usually, uh, subtracts from the social or himself by, uh, smoking, doing drugs or being, uh, loud and provocative and distancing people. And when he's in this underwater world, he's got a helmet on to breathe because uh, he's a horse, and sometimes that matters in the world of the show. Uh, and he, so all of his, he can't smoke, he can't drink, all of his vices are taken away from him, and he just kind of has to sit with himself. And he gets on this, he gets, he takes a bus ride, he goes on this journey, and there's a, a, a I, I'm forgetting the, oh my God, I'm forgetting the aquatic creature. This is like really funny that I'm forgetting it. Oh, it's a seahorse that he's trying to get to its uh, seahorse father. And he goes on like a, like a journey. There's kind of a, he gets stuck in like a taffy factory. There's a little bit of Charlie Chaplin stuff going on uh, with, with, with this in the episode, but it's, um, it's a, a re- like, that's an animated episode. They chose to do this. Uh, there's a family guy episode, Brian and Stewie. They're stuck in a bank vault. Again, animated episode. They choose to right. do this. So, right. so this is, well outside of the like original reason why this form arose, but they kind of clarify what's at stake. And so for me, after this introduction, it's less about a rigorous taxonomy of what a bottle episode is. I don't really, I don't think that's very important. I think what's much more important is to look at what a bottle episode does. What does it put in motion? What, what, what does it snap into relation? What are the stakes? And that is this thing we can see, because you might be tempted uh, to, to, to say, well, there was a classical bottled episode that was more due to economic constraints of the way TV was done uh, in inverted commas back then, and then look at something now like a more modern bottle episode. Which that is done is by a, choice. By, by choice. But I think th- aesthetically you're looking at the same thing, which is, right. you know, we're going to talk about with, um, with Star Trek. So uh, what does a bottle episode do? And why, why do we get there uh, with Hegel? So, Todd, you're a little bit of an expert on, on Hegel. And uh, the most interesting thing uh, about, I would say, uh, about the shift in how we view Hegel, uh, what would you say, in the last, like, 20 years? is a 20, movement away 30 from, years, maybe, yeah. 20, a movement away from thinking of him as a, uh, as a dialectician of synthesis and right. more someone who... Uh, his whole method is about a dialectic of contradiction. So this may seem like a real hard turn (laughs) for this conversation because that was about the bottle episode, but um, obviously I explained this in in the article, but I want to lean on your, your expertise. What's the difference between synthesis and contradiction and and, and why do we need to think of Hegel as a thinker of contradiction and not one of synthesis? Right. So the textbook idea of Hegel is, as you said, you go from thesis to, then there's an opposing antithesis and then you bring the two together in some way and you get a a result of a synthesis. And that I think is the, the, the commonsensical way of understanding Hegel. And it's also the way of understanding Hegel that predominated for, I don't know, 150 years, a little bit more after his death. Right. So, Mm -hmm. but, but as you said, I think to, I think now, I don't know if it's the consensus, but there's certainly a broad number of people that think this. That is that actually Hegel's, the movement of his system is from what seem like identities or syntheses to mm-hmm. contradictions. So, so the, the direction of Hegel's thought is toward contradiction and toward uncovering the contradictions that, as that's in place or at work, not toward... Uh, getting rid of them and uh, achieving some kind of whole harmonious or whole structure. So I think that that's, 
it's it's a pretty radical difference, right? Like between mm. the the two different versions of of Hegel, and I think the one is a much more conservative thinker, even if mm. you think the synthesis is headed is going to be a egalitarian one or whatever. He's still a more conservative thinker, and now I think the idea is that if he if if he's if the idea is oh we that that the end point of Hegel's philosophy, what he called absolute knowing or or absolute idea in different places. That's for him. That is not the point at which we overcome contradiction, but the point at which we realize we cannot overcome contradiction. So that, I think mm-hmm. that that's a that's that in a nutshell. I think captures the distinction between the two ways of thinking about Hegel, and also captures his radicality as a thinker. Because it, I think that that most to take it into the political field, most oppressive systems are are built around this idea that some way we're going to promise overcoming contradiction to you, right? Like that's the, yeah. that's the promise that they make. And, and I think that that's what Hegel disallows as a thinker. So I think that this, this highlighting of contradiction and, and showing that even narrative for Hegel moves, the contradiction drives narrative. And I think this goes against how we usually think of narrative, right? We usually think mm. narrative is driven toward, a conclusion that that eliminates the contradictions or antagonisms that are apparent in it. But Hegel's point is no, actually, it's when we're seeing a, a narrative dramatically work itself out, what we're what's being revealed is the the irreconcilability of the of the the, the things that seem opposed to each other, right? So that there's no yeah. there's no final moment of harmony or or, or completion. Mm. Yeah, it's and this is it is a, that was very nice and, and very concise. Like that, it is exactly at this point that we see this is what I'm claiming. This is what is theoretically at stake in the bottle episode. A lot of TV, like if if you, if you're gonna find a narrative form that's guilty of synthesis, where you have some act one problem, some act two. Uh, you know, a complicating of the problem and then some act three resolution of the thing that wipes away why there was ever like a problem in the first place. I mean, t- like that's, that describes a lot of TV, a lot of uh, television. And, right. And, right. And, and, and you would, you would not be wrong to accuse TV of being a, a synthetic medium in precisely that sense or bad where, Hegelian or a bad it's Hegelian. A, yeah, a bad exactly. Hegelian. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a bad Hegelian medium. Yeah, I, I think that that's right. And I and my uh, not to make like like to make a hierarchy or, or, or tiers of television, but my claim is that like what bottle episodes do is they they don't. This is not their relationship to conflict. It, they it is about deepening the the conflict until it becomes hardened as d- d- genuine contradiction, like of 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 existential impasse, and we have this interesting thing here is that like what happens in bottle episodes is characters become isolated and the, their isolation becomes necessary for a, uh, like, like an emancipatory collective to emerge. And that is typically not how we, we think such things should go. We, we don't, we, we typically, uh, like uh, alienation is, uh, not, often thought of as uh being a good thing or the thing that gets us to uh uh anything uh helpful or 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 liberatory but i think bottle episodes in structure show that the 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 kinds of insights you can come to and things we're going to talk about that i talk about in the essay that we're going to talk about today the the kinds of insights that that you come to it's only possible through the uh confinement that uh and I would say also the the temporal stress that uh, it, the bottle episode gives in, in almost every iteration of, of appearance across uh, all kinds of uh, you know TV shows and even if it's animated, even if it's done by choice. Yeah, um, I like that a lot. That's really good. I mean, I think I think it's an interesting Hegelian image, right? That we're we're we can only be together apart, right? Like that's the that's the yeah. that's I think I, mean, I think you're saying that's what the bottle episode instructs us in that's what it shows yeah yeah and we'll get to him a little bit later there if there would be one critic like one staunch and lucid critic of this precise uh position it would be jean paul sartre who uh for one uh doesn't uh i would say he's even more um i I guess the phrase would be retrograde not not radical but more retrograde retrograde in his reading of hegel in that he doesn't see him as a 
even as a philosopher of synthesis, but sees him as a, uh, a what is it? Oh, a dialectical monism is a phrase he right, uses in right, both that's the critique phrase, of yeah. yeah, critique of dialectical reason and uh, volumes one and two. Uh, so he he doesn't uh, he doesn't see Hegel as in any way uh, uh, grappling with contradiction in the way that uh, we do, in the way that uh, I propose in this article. So um, the best way to to sort of so we've sort of like laid all this out the you know wh- where where the bottle episode phrase comes can from can i say one more what thing it, about what that? it is yeah yeah jump yeah because yeah, yeah, I, I think it's there's one thing that's in and i wonder what you think about this this is more of a mm. question than a comment i i think it's one of the only terms that starts out as a production term and becomes a critical term right like mm. like say like film noir it has the other trajectory right like first it was right. french critics used it to talk about a certain kind of film that was made and then all of a sudden Studios were like, "Hey, we can make a film noir, right?" So, so <laughs> I I think that it seems more often that it goes the other way that 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 mm. a a critical analysis of something uncovers a concept and then it gets integrated into production. I mean, just famously, Double Indemnity was produced as a melodrama, right. and then it's only right. after the fact that people said, "Oh, wait, this is a film noir," and and I and I think Bottle Episode seems to me is one of the few that goes with a few concepts that goes in this direction from production to criticism. Although I, I mean, maybe it, it hasn't even really fully gone into criticism because I think your essay is one of the first, I mean, there's a couple of critical articles, right? But it's one of the first ones. Uh, that is very kind of you to say, uh, I'm Todd can say that about me and the article. I'm not going to say that about myself. I mean, I will, I mean, I will say that like a lot of, well, no, it's just like, a fact, isn't it? I mean, yeah. it's not like a, Oh, it's the greatest first one. I just, <laughs> <the first> one. <laughs> all right. That's a good point. Good point by you. Yeah. And, and I mean, nice, I think uh, it's very <laughs> good, but I, I didn't, I did I was just saying it is the, it is, I think it is the first one. Right. I think that, um, well, a lot of what I think what would separate, if you're asking me what, what's, uh, in a, um, in a shadow way, what's different about this from other engagements? I, I do think it's exactly this this point of like a lot of work and a lot of valuable work on uh, the bottle episode has gone into what it is, and uh, not not so much on what it does or looking at sort of like the existential or theoretical stakes that like I'm trying to get right, to. Right. In the, right. Uh, in the I don't article. think there's anybody that's addressed. I think most of the the theoretical debate isn't theoretical. It's just a critical. It's like an evaluative. Yeah is this a yeah. bottle episode or is it not? Like what's this really right, famous right. one that's pretty recent that everyone thinks the bottle episode that oh. isn't? <laughs> oh, well see, I, cause I agree. I, I think the opposite. Yeah. So your reference, Todd is referencing the last of us. So there's an episode called long, long time that, uh, caused a little bit of debate, uh, on the, uh, on the interwebs, uh, with a lot of people saying like, Oh my God, the last of us did a bottle episode. And then, um, you know, a lot of TV critics, uh, popular TV critics saying that it's not and and trying to make this distinction between uh, what a bottle episode is and and that or even that or even trying to go so far as to uh, there's a, a writer who uh, a, a scholar a popular writer who I cite in the essay Catherine Van Arendonk she writes for um, Vulture she writes wonderful things on Succession by the way too like uh, she's great on 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 that on that series and I uh, I quote her in the in in my bottle episode article I think she's great the way she thinks about the episode as form uh, which there's also precious uh, little of that in in right. academic scholarship right. uh, yeah. as well and um, her preference is to to t- talk to kind of ditch bottle episode I think precisely because of its uh, production. Uh, related, oh, interesting. Uh, interesting. Uh, history. And she wants to talk about departure episodes. That's what, that's kind of her phrase I for things. And I, and I, and like, again, like, I think like, I, 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 I see her point like, like completely. I, and I think it's like very, a, a, a worthwhile discussion on that. But like, again, it's this like is versus does thing that like, I, I don't, I don't know that we'll, I don't know the, um, there, I think there is more to be gained from, uh, like looking at what it does and to be, uh, like like stretching that across uh, television history, then to try to like really drill down into uh, like like a like a, the most like like minimal uh, definition that that we that we can of this thing, and I'm, that's not exactly what she does, but she her because her point is that bottle episodes are a departure from what a show normally does, and so I I think the problem with that that immediately comes to mind is that. Um, the once more with feeling the musical episode, the great musical episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, a right. show close to both of us. Or um, hush. It, yeah, oh, or okay, yeah. So, but Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the, like that. But once more with feeling, that's a departure episode, but it's also a musical episode. But then, 
I, I, I like I don't know that people would call it a bottle episode because they're not in like one location. They right. kind of go all over. The production is like much bigger. Um, but I think for for me, I think I would consider it a bottle episode because the characters are confined by something. And this is where like where I think Hegel is really important is what are they confined by? And they're confined by this uh, like dilemma that, that becomes intractable. And it is only by finding like and it like an impossibility, like like really an impossible way of solving the uh, the, the issue, like a, a possibility that could not have emerged uh, just without the limit, right. without the limit, without this instantiation of the limit, without this, without the confinement. That to me is what like defines and, and what is it, mobilized by the bottle episode. And so that's what goes on in Once More with Feeling, you know, and I think that's what, go, what, go, what goes on in Hush. And uh, back, like to go back to The Last of Us, which I know you haven't seen, but maybe other people have, is that like the like the impossibility of having like a, like a community of two or even just a couple in this post-apocalyptic world, like the, these, the relationship between these two characters is what confines each other because one eventually becomes sick and uh, the other one, uh, the the romantic relationship between these two men, like that, it defines their lives. And they, uh, I'll just put it this way: like they go out together, and like because it's the confinement of that relationship that allows for the two of them to have a life in this post-apocalyptic world. Huh. And that it, it would have been impossible otherwise. And there's even like kind of a nice thing where like the Nick Offerman character, when the world was the world, was a, a closeted gay man, and it's it's like it's only in the apocalypse that he can be out, you know. So like, in, yeah. it's only again, it's through this isolation that you see this like this this flowering, I would say, and 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 uh, that I I think is is always at work in in uh in bottle episodes that something just arises and emerges out of them that it needs the ringer of the of confinement and uh and constraint to get to that wouldn't have just emerged uh naturally over the course of uh episodes the way they they they, they like typically go you I like that a lot can I kind of constraint yeah go ahead just just to clarify so so for you mm-hmm. hush is a bottle episode because mm-hmm. the the formal limitation of of like you can't speak right like that yes and, and same thing with once more with feeling that you have to articulate yes. yourself in song okay that's yes a, I, I like that a lot i think that that's really good like the because what happens at the end of that episode is that uh spike and, and buffy they they well for one they kiss but also buffy reveals that she had died and gone to heaven and her right. friends in bringing her back to life actually condemn her and that, right. that, that, like, like that's, this usually happens in, I mean, I, I think this is where you also have this like overlap. A lot of the times in musical episodes uh, of shows that don't normally do musical episodes, it enables characters to say things that otherwise they couldn't. Right. And, and so that I would say is, is more like, that's like sort of the overlapping circle on a Venn diagram with the bottle episode. I think that's what always happens in a bottle episode is the characters say things that they, they otherwise couldn't, but they needed the uh, the form, the structure, like community is so good on this, like in cooperative calligraphy, uh, the character, char- which take community takes place in a college and the, uh, it starts with something really anodyne and, uh, where a character loses their pen, uh, or it was stolen or they dropped it or whatever, but it's, right. uh, the character name is Annie. Uh, we, we, uh, we, what is it? We went past sorry, Annie seven pens ago. Like, and it's not about like, she says early in the episode, it's not a, it's not about a pen. It's a principle. And she doesn't feel like her place in the study group is taken very seriously. People take things from her. They take her study notes. Britta invoked the freedom of information act to get copies of her uh, notes for a class. And uh, uh, this didn't happen on the show, but this is something she says uh, in the episode itself. And so all these characters, like in, in the tensions that are between them, they come out in uh in the bottle episode because they have to it's like i describe this to students this way it's like being in a long car ride with someone it doesn't matter how good friends you are or how great a relationship you have with a romantic partner be in a car long enough you will get agitated with someone it does not matter how how long (laughs) that like like like, like, or how good it is you're in that car something will you know there will be this like like if you change if you're switching driving or right. and then you stop too soon, there just will just something right. will come up. Like that's just yeah. like that's just how it works. Um 
uh, what is it? In, uh, I, I, in I, can I just tell you okay. a funny thing? I broke up yeah, with ahead. my girlfriend in high school because of <laughs> a drive back. We, we were on vacation uh, in the, at this lake in Kentucky. We, I lived in Ohio. And uh, yeah. we were driving back home, and I was reading Old Man in the Sea when she was driving. Mm-hmm. And we were, I had like five pages left, and she's like, I just can't drive anymore. And I'm like, you've got to be <laughs> kidding me. I go, I have five pages left. I, 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 you got to keep driving. She just pulled to the side and got out of the car. And I said, it's, it's over between us. Like you just totally, <laughs> so this is worse than your loss story. That, I think that is a little bit worse. I appreciate you, uh, you, you helping me out there, but it's, it's like that. It's like the line in the rhyme of the ancient mariner, water, water everywhere. And all the boards did shrink. Yeah. Water, water yeah. everywhere, nor any drop to drink. But like that, yeah. that's the, that first part I find yeah. more interesting. And yeah, all the yeah. boards did shrink. It's great. You know? I love like, that idea like, of the car ride. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, so that's why that's why families that go on a long vacation end up hating each other, right? Like it's impossible <laughs> not to because the, and this often becomes a t- like a plot in a t- TV series, right? right. Like the the right. vacation, you know, uh, episode right. or, or um, right. yeah, that uh, not necessarily bottle episodes, but that's always the you know. There's a great Simpsons episode where they uh, they go to Itchy and Scratchy Land, and um, it turns it turns into. Um, it's it's pr- probably the Simpsons were, were is the only piece of media that understood that Michael Crichton uh, just did Westworld again with Jurassic Park. Only it was a lot more popular, but like no, but at the time, like nobody, like yeah, anyway. So because the episode is both Jurassic Park and it's and it's Westworld, and they end up having to save the park, and Marge just wanted a nice vacation, and they say to her at the end of the episode, like we got we did exactly what you wanted. We got lots of. Uh, exercise outdoors. We really came together in the end, and but they had to kill a bunch of robots to save themselves <laughs> after after being abandoned. And she just hears she hears Lisa say that and says, "You're right." Now let us never speak of this again. <laughs> so it's like it was so e- even even in this in this way, like uh, right. you know what what happens in that episode is she gets exactly what she wants, but in this inverted form and such that it should never be spoken of again. Right. And also, it's an episodic series that is like usually things don't carry over like the Simpsons have really elastic wealth from one episode to another, one season to another and uh, you know, whatever. So that's, a, that's a formal, a structural reason why you wouldn't bring up with that. But I think narratively speaking, yes, that it like the, the vacation episode, the family gets upset with themselves. They find a new way to, to, uh, to relate to each other, which is what I, I think is at work in the bottle episode, this especially at work in, uh, in cooperative calligraphy, the group has to come together um, and the the study group and community has to come together in a way that they hadn't before. And there's a third season bottle episode, even better on this point. And I want to, cause I want to name, I want to give a specific example to a kind of contradiction before we talk about some other, some other examples Um, that the uh, the very famous, there's like so many memes that come from this episode. It's called uh, remedial chaos theory. I believe this one was written by Megan Gans, who is the uh, King and queen of uh, the bottle episode. She's uh, wrote a couple for community, but also um, uh, really wonderfully for it's always sunny in Philadelphia Um, and the uh, Apple uh, TV series, uh, mythic quest. And uh, so the, the setup of remedial chaos theory is that they're waiting for pizza, the characters. um, And there's, uh, they all do this game, Todd, I don't know if you know this, called Nose Goes. So no, no. You all, <laughs> so you touch your nose, you're in a group of people, so someone has to do something, but it's not any one person's responsibility, like go to the door to get the, get the pizza, go downstairs. Okay. And so you touch your nose, okay? And anyone who didn't touch their nose, the nose goes. You understand? Like that's how the... So if you didn't touch your nose, you have to go. You got to go do it. So, but they all perfectly touch their nose at the same time. So they're about to play Yahtzee and uh, Jeff says like, Hey, you know what? Starting from my left, um, you, your, your number one through six, it comes up, you go to get the pizza. And then Abed says, just so you know, Jeff, you're now creating six alternate timelines. And he says, of course I am Abed. And then this really great thing, he flips the die in the air. And then the, uh, there's this kind of graphic that comes over the screen where it's like a almost kind of like like a uh like a almost like a uh, like a like a tabletop game board with like uh timelines stemming out from the middle e- related to each number so he throws the the die in the air and it goes through one of them and then each time they go through this episode goes through each of these different timelines and something different happens and what's really great about this episode um and this is in um the Star Trek episode, uh, Tholian Web, as well, is that you um, you gain a, 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 
excellent understanding of group dynamics by which character leaves, not by who stays, but who right. leaves. Right. And so the, it, it's this really wonderful thing that the episode does is it makes the, it's like my phrase for this, I mean, I didn't come up with this phrase, but like it makes an absent absence present. And, and like in Tholi and Webb, Kirk is absent. And because Kirk is, is, uh, is like, is in interphase, the uh, differences between uh, Spock and McCoy have to play out right. in a really like in a really uh, um, stressful and like high, uh, high intensity way. So the way that the, this episode of community ends is that, and there's all kinds of memes like the, like uh, Troy Donald Glover's character leaves the room. And I, I know students have, and, and I think other people have seen this, uh, this frame, this from the show, or, or uh, these like two shots from the show, but they haven't actually seen the show itself. He, it's one guy goes to get the pizza, and when he comes back, the room is on fire, and it, it's uh, so that's that's like that's a often a, a used as a meme. Your son actually, Dashiell, said to me when he started watching Community, he said, "Did you know that half of all memes are from this show?" Like he's being. <laughs> uh, like, you know, obviously, uh, um, hyperbolic, but I was like, right. yeah, dude, I was, I was there when the show was there when the show was live. I remember, right. I remember, but anyway, so the, so you see all these six different timelines and then the way the episode ends is Abed in the prime timeline, he grabs the dice. So it doesn't hit the table. And he says that chaos dominates enough of our lives and that, you know, that you shouldn't be putting up something like this to, to chance. We need to like stick together from the things that we know to be true. And uh, he has this like this unbelievable insight and uh, which is that we have to be accepting of each other's flaws and virtues. And he kind of goes around the table and he says, it's not, he doesn't talk about every character, but he just says one thing. He says, Shirley will always be giving. Uh, Pierce will never apologize. Britta is kind of a wild card from my perspective. Uh, and Jeff will always be a conniving son of a bitch. And there's a, there, there's a, I think he maybe said something about Annie that I'm forgetting about. And uh, the, 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 his relationship with Troy is like well played out, but th this, that's not the, that's not the point. What the point is, is that he says one thing. He says, we need to be accepting of each other's flaws and virtues. And then says one thing about each person, because and this would be the Hegelian reading here, because your flaw is your virtue and your virtue right. is your flaw. Right. It's it, you, 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 the great, the best thing about you is the worst thing about you. And the worst thing about you is the best thing about you. And there, and it's not, you, you can't like, uh, I think that there's a lot of like, uh, there's a lot of like self-help culture that like seeps into everyday life where it's like, Oh, you have to li live your best self, which would be what maximizing the best thing about you and minimizing the worst thing about you. And I think what this episode of community and what I'm claiming and what I'm saying, like, you know, uh, Hegel would help us see is that it's the same thing. You, you know, you can't, you can't be like a really open and warm person and then be like rigorous about what people you're warm and open to. Cause that's not being warm and open, you know, like, like surely in the context of the episode, uh, Shirley makes pie for like for everyone. And, and, and like, that doesn't seem like it's an issue, but she, the, as Jeff says in one of the timelines, she has a baking problem. She put in, as Britta says in another one, she pushes pies for love. <laughs> like she's always like, she's right. always, she's a pie right. pusher, you know? And, and it's, it's the, this is the thing is like, she can't, the group, ha it's not that she has to be different. It's the group has to accept that this thing that has been articulated quite often as a flaw, that's her central virtue. And I think this is what the, uh, like the, the bottle episode uh, often mobilizes about like, like characters is that like, like, um, I don't know, like, would you say that this is at work in, uh, Thol in like Tholi and Webb as well? Like, I mean, like you, you can't have, you can't have the rationality of, uh, of Spock, you know, w w it, it, without, like, I mean, this is often played against him as a character is his rationality and his like emotional decision making. Right. And then right. and like and I think with McCoy, it's it ends up being sort of like inverted, but they can't be who they are without those two things being intention, you know? Absolutely um, true. Right. It's absolutely yeah. true. And I think that like, I, I mean, one of the great things about the Tholian Webb episode, which you've you've referenced a few times, which is one of my favorite Star Trek episodes, it's an episode where they go to this deep part of space and that there's that space is the fabric of space is weak. 
And so mm-hmm. Kirk yeah. ends up disappearing, and then he's in this, what's called, you named it earlier, it's called Interface. And so they have to try to recover him later, and they're not sure if they can recover him because he's been caught in the transporter beam. Uh, coming back from this other ship that has been destroyed by this the structure space because everyone, and actually ever on the ship, I think everyone killed each other because yes. of the the tension created by this uh this kind actually the tension created by the long car ride right like like <laughs> yes it, yeah it's yeah. interesting that that doesn't <laughs> like that doesn't really come up i mean they're on a deep space long car ride throughout the series mm-hmm. and that never comes yeah. up except when they get into this other kind of space in the tholian mm-hmm. web and that but then what's interesting is i think you're right that the very things that are good about the things that are best about Spock are also the things that are worst to him about him. And the yes. things that are best about McCoy are the, the same thing that's worst about him. And I think that's really, so this is a nice instance where a uh, contradiction gets played out. And I think you hmm. could read it as no, this is the opposition between two characters. Right. And I think mm-hmm. th- that Tholian Webb nicely shows the distinction between those two things. So the, mm-hmm. the, the contradiction within both yes. Spock and McCoy is, is the tension. And then yes. that manifests itself as uh, they, they come to almost to blows. I mean, they couldn't come to blows because mm. Spock would destroy them, but they, 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 <laughs> they, they, they come, they come at odds with each other and they, they fight with each other viciously, but yeah. it's really this internal contradiction within each of them that's being manifest, which I, which I think, which gets man, made manifest because of the, the bottle structure, the limit structure that's there. Yeah, this no, this is exactly right and really, really nice. I'm glad you brought brought us onto this point. It's it's not the conflict between that ends up becoming like important. It's like it's the conflict within. Like you have to see this like as as being like inescapable, uh, and that's this uh, this source of torsion that drives what uh, what happens narratively and also toward uh, some kind of impossibility. Like. Uh, it, the I, I say this in, in this essay that like we, we have to understand about the dialectic for for Hegel is that it's it's pushing pushing our understanding of something to note the interdependence of things upon their own internal uh, opposition. Right. And y- what you have to see is, and I don't have this phrase. I have this in the book version of of this chapter, not in this this, but um, maybe I'll add it. I don't know. Who knows? But you have to see how opposite becomes apposite. That's the idea. That's what like. Right. That's very good. That's very good. I mean, it, it, it's why Hegel is the total anti Carl Schmidt, right? So Carl Schmidt is this yeah. thinker who thinks that w- one is constituted through one's enemy. That the field of the political requires a figure of the enemy, and I think Hegel mm-hmm. just uh, doesn't allow that. Like the enemy is always this internal figure for him, mm-hmm. right? First, it's an internal enemy, and it's only because there's an internal enemy that there could even possibly be an external one. So I think that's right. a really, I think that's important to see the to see the, the division or the cut as an internal one first, and mm-hmm. then all kinds of external oppositions are only, only exist on the basis of that, which I, mm-hmm. it's, it, it really differentiates Hegel, I think, from a lot of other, a lot of other thinkers who, who, like Schmidt, but even other thinkers that want to insist on external divisions only, right? And not yeah. internal. Well, yeah, I mean, that's kind of interesting. I mean, that's that ends up being Sartre's problem with, it um, is. Yeah. with, with Hegel and also his problem with, as his phrase is, seriality, which is relevant to, to talk about here. Um, because what Sartre's whole thing is that there's an external order from capital that groups us superficially so that we have no uh, meaningful... Uh, tie to each right. other in in the social and this um i i he said he says it directly that it needs to be eradicated so not like overcome not like not like the oh we become serialized by capital and it's because we're grouped superficially that we can move beyond it no 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 he doesn't he doesn't want that or think that he he thinks it, it's the thing that has to be done away with and right it, the the bot the the bottle episode and i think this is why hegel draws his ire is has the complete opposite idea which is like you have to there has to be something like this is why the, the community is such a good example there has to be something superficial like a pen going missing or like g- having so who who's going to go get pizza that moves you move from the superficial tie to like the more existential tie you move from superficial uh tensions to like really deep um right. and uh, like immovable ones and it's only through this 
I, I, I claim, I think this is what bottle episodes do. It's only through the, uh, this isolation and alienation that, that, that tension can be even like articulated in any way, like, like, like spoken or dramatized or whatever. Like this is the, the suitcase, like probably, um, I think there are two, two episodes that, that often come up in like best bottle episodes, um, would be the suitcase is episode of Mad Men, uh, Pine Barrens episode of Sopranos. Um, there's a absolutely wonderful episode of, um, the leftovers called, uh, international assassin, assassin. That is, a a, a, a bottle episode. I would even argue there's this, the, what everyone agrees is the greatest episode of lost called the constant. I would even say like, according to my, the way that I think about it, that's a bottle episode. Interesting. And what what lot- about balance of terror? Don't you think a lot of people think that's one of the best star Trek episodes? They do. Yeah. And so the thing with balance of terror, so this, this is, I'm glad you brought this up. The, like the thing that, sometimes like like people try to get like a real like like a purity of a bottle episode so like yeah. in the suit in the suitcase there are multiple locations like like don makes peggy work this copy for the samsonite uh uh i don't know campaign i'm not sure uh, the, the they even priorities. go out to dinner don't they i mean they, they leave go the out office. to dinner yeah, yeah. They, they leave and and so that sort of violates the like the singular location thing like of the seinfeld episode the chinese restaurant where right. they are yeah. waiting for a table and it happens in like it unfolds almost in in live time or like i said even the animated the brian and stewie one uh episode where there's they're in a bank vault the whole time so like they leave and so what the what the suitcase makes clear it even has a really great line that that might be the like this is the line for like what defines a bottle episode is um there's a there's a mouse or a rat in uh don's uh office and peggy sees it and says it's a rat and don says it's a mouse i grew up on a farm which that in almost any other show is not a statement that uh, worth noting but he revealed something about himself in that statement something honest and vulnerable but as he's looking at the you know where the mouse came in he has this line he says there's uh there must be there are ways uh oh god am i gonna blow this i'll have to look it up i want to make sure i get it right but uh, to to make sure so i'll say what i'm remembering it and then i'll look it up to make sure i'm right but there are ways out of this there are ways out of this room we don't know about and and that is like the i think the thesis statement for the bottle episode which is like there's ways out of this intractable uh conflict that you don't know about when it starts and the only way to get there is through a hardening of contradiction not avoiding it and so like the so the going to multiple locations okay that's in I know they're on the sh- on the ship the whole time, but in Balance of Terror, that starts in a wedding. There's even a part of Balance of Terror where Kirk takes a nap. So like the there the also this idea that it's like like constant um, right like closeness like uh, Breaking Bad's Fly right where where it's like it's it's tense or like it unfolds in real time and like like yes like temporality is often uh, a, a constraint that produces a lot of what's uh, at stake in the bottle episode but like Balance of Terror which I think is always cited as the like I don't know like the like so I think in some conversations I've, I've seen it's like like the Ur bottle episode is like right. Balance of Terror right. um, but yeah they're in multiple locations and. Well, we see in the Romulan ship as well, right? Like that's the whole, yeah. Well, and so what's the impossibility, like the impossibility that's generated here is like Kirk and this Romulan uh, captain, like uh, they develop a a respect and affection for each other and they never see each other because it's through precisely, or or talk, talk. it's yeah, it's precisely through the, how they mitigate the, uh, the circumstance of being in, um, uh, what what would you say? Like a, a contested space. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Between the Romulans and the, uh, you know, there's, there's this great line in 30 rock Todd where, um, uh, Tracy, Tracy Morgan is, uh, talking about Romeo and Juliet Capulets and Romulans. <laughs> and it's a, I always, I always think about that. So it's a real Capulets and Romulans story. Yeah. The ba- balance yeah. of terror. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's multiple locations. There's two ships. Like again, like I said, Kirk takes a nap, so that sort of like breaks some of the tension for a little bit. But he can't really sleep, so I mean, there's that. But like, but what's also what interesting thing- is yeah, isn't it, isn't the the internal? I mean, it, it just supports what you were saying earlier that the there there's an internal conflict on board the Enterprise that then yes. 
is reduplicated in the external conflict between the Enterprise and the Romulan ship, right? There's this yes. racism uh, incident yeah. with the Navigator and Spock, and then that mm-hmm. gets, and then that, that, so there's this internal bo- division, and then that mm. is, that's then mirrored by this external one, right? Yes. No, that's, a, I mean, that's a great point. Yeah. Like that's the, like that's the, and that is like, that's what you, that's what you get in these, in these episodes is, is like this, again, this, like this, uh, either like a minor thing or a superficial thing, or it is this, this difference between ends up like becoming the, like the difference within that, like that, that has to be, uh, this, this conflict, this deep conflict within, within that has to be, um, I, I the word that I would pursue is, is not mitigated, but reconciled. Like, right. Like, it, right. It, you know, like, it, and it has to be like, so, you know, in the, in the suitcase, the, what the, the impossibility that emerges in that is that like Don, to, uh, he, he admits to Pe- Peggy, he, he's, he has harangued her at work because he doesn't want to call, uh, a, there's, he got a phone call from California and he knows he's going to talk to someone and they're going to tell him that, uh, a person who's very important to him has died of cancer. Yeah. And so, he is doing everything he can to avoid that conversation. And it's like, so there are divisions between him and Peggy, but it's like those, those divisions between the two of them are just like kind of the rocket boosters that get to the division that's within Don. And that ends up being the, like this thing. And he like, you know, he squeezes her hand at the end. Of, like, again, it's just like, like, that's the, the thing with Mad Men is that like, you, you have to look at these, you, you always have to look at like what a show uh, does kind of on its own terms. Don saying that he grew up on a farm and like squeezing Peggy's hand and like making it very clear how much she means to him like that. Like, that's like, uh, I, I don't know, like on another show that would be like two characters being on a rooftop shouting their love for each other and like, right, like right, you know, and it's right. not romantic between Don and Peggy, but you, you under, you understand what I mean yeah. uh, with that. So um, the, and that, that's another thing that I think is like so wonderful about bottle episodes is that they are, they, they do show you what is like show specific, which is why I, I say, you know, that that episode of uh, Last of Us is, is is a bottle episode because, like, relative to the, like, the world of that show, like, two people having a, like, a life for themselves in a, in a town, like, that's a, that's a, they have made a community. They have, like, impossibly made a community in this, uh, in, in this world. We wouldn't say that, like, you wouldn't say that in our world. You would, you would say that those are probably the two nimbiest people, right, who exist. Like, you're just, and you're not, you're not engaging in, in the social at all. You're, right. you're, you're, right. you're uh, just cordoning yourselves off. Like there, there, that there's no kind of sociality there uh, to speak of, but again, relative to the show, it is. And I think it's like, it's, it's the, you know, you, you have to, you, you, it, it's, it's what makes, it's what makes the bottle episode so vibrant. And I think so interesting is that like the shows playing within like their own constraints like shows you something that was like unique about the show, unique about the characters. It gives this like absolute platform, uh, for, um, l- like the, the, again, for the impossibility to burst forth. And you can see this when it doesn't happen, which is in breaking bad's fly. When, um, Walt is on the verge of telling Jesse that he's responsible for, uh, I would say killing his, uh, his girlfriend cause he yeah. watched her die. Um, but he doesn't do it. And, but like the fact that he gets that close even is but, the, like, is the impossibility. Yeah. What do you want? You want to can ask you a question? Is he going to, yeah. at this point, if he, is he going to say it as a confession? Cause when he ends up saying it, he doesn't say it as a confession. He says it as a way to injure Jesse further, right? Yes. No, he says he's going to, that's a great, great point by you. He's going to say it as a confession. Yeah. In, in, yeah. in, in, in this, and, and that, and that confessional, aspect is like is only possible like through the uh through the rigor that they're strained through i said rigor but uh that was a kind of a nice slip but ringer (laughs) i think you got to think of those two things together uh with the bottle episode and the being stuck in the this like underground meth lab. right they're stuck in the underground meth lab right which we see being built in in better call saul right (laughs) yeah that's right (laughs) That's right. Okay. That's a good point. So like the, um, so Saul has, so Saul has a, um, an episode that has a, a um, when, uh, Mike and, uh, and Saul are stuck in the desert yeah, without water. 
that is um, reminiscent of uh, the Pine Barrens episode of Sopranos, which I mentioned. And one of the things that, if you haven't seen Pine Barrens episode uh, or the Sopranos, um, this will be lost on you, as I imagine maybe a lot of these references have been. But what's at stake, I think, is is very clear, is that two characters... uh, Pauly and Christopher went to go collect money from a Russian guy, and then Pauly was oversensitive and beat the guy up, and it got to a situation where he had to be killed and disposed of, and they decided to do it in uh, South Jersey, in the Pine Barrens. Um, only they, so they make this guy dig his own grave, but he was a, um, you know, Todd, he was an interior decorator, and he killed 16 Czechoslovakians. Do you remember that? That's what I Pauly do remember hears. that. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So Pauly hears yeah. on the phone. That's a, It's Chechnins, and Chechnins, he was in yeah, the interior yeah. ministry, but he it's a bad phone connection, so he gets <laughs> the bad information. So um, and he gets, um, and so the guy gets loose, the, uh, the, the Russian commando, ex-Russian commando, and they are stuck in the Pine Barrens, trying to make sure that they killed this guy and they can't find him. They can't find him. And then they get lost. And and then they get lost. And it's this really cool thing where normally in a bottle episode, you're confined by a tight space, but they're confined by the cold uh, of the Pine Barrens and the, like just this vast. Well, the open space confines them. That's what's interesting. Right. Yeah. It's like the film. I don't know if you've ever seen it follows, but it follows mobilizes that really well for a horror film because normally in a horror film like you think you're safe in a wide open space but that's where you're most in danger and yeah that's true that's true yeah and and so um yeah so so pine barrens makes the open space closed but that so this is what a lot of people focus on when they talk about that as a bottle episode but like it's really it's really tony who is confined by what paul and christopher and other people are doing throughout the entire episode and um it's 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 the it's it's like he 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 goes to in and out of spaces he's having an affair like he's like basically like he's collecting money from someone like he's not exactly ordering a hit on someone but he like kind of is he's making like so he has like all like you would say like he has all this freedom and autonomy but like as the episode plays out like he is just constantly not cleaning up people's messes because he doesn't really do that but he's just constantly like tied inextricably tied to other people and the that like comes to a head where he uh where Dr. Melfi like makes it clear that romantically he's reproducing these relationships that are um like volatile and toxic because of his relationship with his mother which is really funny cuz what I think it's in the first episode where he says um he went to a semester and a half of college so he understands Freud so I yeah. think that's like a so I think that's that that would kind of be like a semester and a half of uh, college of Freud yeah. v- version yeah. of Freud, but so like Freud, you know yeah. Yeah. we put that we put that to one side. But the the po- the point of it though is that like his his he is invested in these conflicts. Like like I think that's like that's the that would be the takeaway is that like you right. he can say all right. he wants that he doesn't like them, but like then why do they keep happening around him? Right. You know like why does why does he, it's it's you know like like the there is a there, there is an enjoyment, an illicit enjoyment that uh, he consciously would disavow, but that he gets from these situations that really like tie his hands and, and make it so that he doesn't have the autonomy that he wishes he did. Right. And I so. think that the, you know, he's so upset with Paulie and Christopher, yes. but it's, he's upset because they're revealing his own, the way he's created his own traps right like i think yes. that's i think that's what's yeah. really good about this show right i mean it's yeah. interesting because i think most people that like it like it because they think christopher and Polly are funny together because they're mm-hmm. they, they're mm-hmm. constantly berating each other and they're just and they get on each other's nerves it's just like the car ride you know it's it's as if yeah, they're in a yeah. car they even get in a, it's interesting they even they get, get in, in the van. van yeah yeah they get yeah. in a van in the in the woods um but i think i think you're right like what's more interesting is how their dynamic forces tony in a way, they express the internal contradiction within Tony in their mm. opposition to each other, I think, right? Nice. Like it's a, it's a think yeah. of it, one way to think of it. But I, I, I do love the way that the, the, the open expanse is the, is the confinement. I think that's really yes. good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, it's really, I mean, in, in, like, you know, also just speaking of, of Christopher and Polly, I mean, this is, uh, you know, this, to, to, to dip into my Italian heritage, uh, not for nothing, uh, Todd, but also in that episode, um, uh, Christopher says to to Polly that uh, you're gonna you're gonna wait till you're gonna wait till I'm asleep. You're gonna strangle me in this car. And how does he die? 
He, How does Christopher Tony, die? How does Christopher die? Tony. Oh, Tony, Tony strangles him. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He suffocates right. him in the car. Yeah. Exactly. Anyway, yeah. so that's like yeah, a, yeah. Uh, that's good. a little, little bit of a little bit of a thing there that uh, um, I don't know. Uh, intentional foreshadowing, but like, well, it's, did, it's certainly, I guess certainly he did die back. that way. I was going to say he, he died. I mean, the car crash, you think he could have survived it? Yeah. I mean, like if he could have, if he could have, could, if he could if not t- have survived it. Why does Tony I close Tony his nose? You, you know right. what I mean? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Good point. So, yeah. Um, well, I, I, but, I guess my uh, yeah. reading of it, this is wrong. I'm sure was that we just <laughs> gave away a major spoiler to Sopranos. Um, but, but mm-hmm. my, my that happens. my reading of it was that he, he, he it's just Tony's utter malice, malice, yeah, right? Yeah. Like that, yeah. that even though he's going to die anyway, he wants to kill him. But, he wants to, maybe, want to do it. No, it's that's pretty, probably it's wrong. Pretty, no, that's probably wrong. No, no, no. I, li- I like it. I mean, I think. I mean, uh, I think doesn't Hegel teach us Todd that it can be and is two things? Uh, maybe so, so. Maybe so. Yeah. yeah. So it has yeah. to be that. That like like he. He does it to make sure, but he also, but I, I do like your little, your little rider on this. Like he does it because he can do it. Yeah. And he know? enjoys it. I think like he, yeah. he, like, like that's what we see in the other very fans. It's, it's a kind of a bottle episode too, isn't it? College where, where oh, yeah. people, Tony people and Meadow take a trip yeah. together. It's in the first season. Yeah. And a lot of people think that's mm-hmm. the best episode of the entire series. I don't necessarily think that, but again, Tony kills a guy he doesn't need to kill. No, it doesn't it's need just, to kill him. Cause he just, yeah. he, I mean, need, I mean, I don't know that anybody needs to kill anyone. Uh, <laughs> that would be an interesting, uh, no, but, but, narr- but narratively, no, but this is the thing. Like I, like when, when it, I mean, I know that it, so it's Sopranos and like a lot of characters die, like, you know, uh, often, uh, or are killed, but like, there is a thing where if a character is going to die in a show, like there has to be, I, I think the pressure has to be like, there needs to be a reason for it. And the reason has to be there's something that you had to do like narratively or character wise that required that person to, to to die as a character, like to be able to do. And I think that there's like, so there's nothing like personally for Tony that is that this existence of this guy is uh, mitigating, right? There's no no threat threat whatsoever. So what it tell, what it does tell us is about, is about Tony. So he needs to die so we can learn this thing about Tony. Right, right. Especially exactly. Earlier. Exactly. It's interesting because yeah. I think it's a yeah. real contrast, Sopranos and Americans, because almost every death oh, in yeah. Sopranos is like, it, it, it's just excessive, right? Like just, yeah. but in, in Americans, it's clear that if they don't kill the person, they're going to be exposed as Russian spies. Right. Right. right? right. So they, they, it's like, you know, like maybe they, they don't seem to even get off on it. Right. They don't, no, they seem no. to like, well, they, it's not that they're totally reluctant, but they'd rather not kill the person. I mean, they, they, yeah. they, they think of themselves as communists, so they would, <laughs> they wouldn't rather not kill the person. But I, it, there's a great episode where they're, they're, uh, putting a, a recording device in a robot that's going to be in the FBI. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. there's a woman that comes back to work and then, and, and, uh, is it Carrie? Is that her name? I think it is. Oh yeah. I think you're right. Uh, anyway, the, the, the yeah. woman American, uh, she, the, well, well, Philip, I know his name is Philip. Um, he, he's working on the, on the robot installing the microphone. She encounters this woman who's, who's come to work late at night and thus they're going to have to, cause they have to cover their tracks or their little spy right. operation won't work. And so then she makes this woman overdose on her heart medicine yeah. and, and, the, and the woman, and, and, and she goes, you know, at least you should know that we're doing this to make the world a better place. And then the woman says to her, that's what every evil person says to themselves. And it's a great, yeah. it's a great yeah. moment. I think that, you know, you yeah. get this, I mean, that's not an, that's not a bottle episode, but I think that that, it, you know, that's what the difference between that show and Sopranos is really interesting. Cause there's not that self justification that all these killings are somehow necessary. Instead, mm. they're there to reveal something about the, about the killer, right? Or about usually yeah. about Tony, I think. Yeah. No, that's really interesting. I mean, even in Pine Barrens, it ends with him. He has to wipe tears away from his eyes because he's he's trying to say to Melfi that he does everything. He just says, "Why does everything have to be so hard?" Yeah. Like he said, yeah. "I do everything f- for my family," which is the you know that's like the Walter White line. But like, um, and it's also the succession line too. It's interesting yes, how that is the succession. It really line functions yeah. as yeah. a real ideological hook. I think the family it's, idea. I think what, you know, we in, in, uh, in this podcast for this venue, probably there's too much to get into, but it does show that like 
uh, family is maybe the best master signifier. Master yeah. signifier being being a term from uh, Jacques Lacan, meaning a signifier without a signified. And because of its lack of, uh, what would you say, con- concrete signification, that it can just be, uh, it can web together almost anything. Yeah, and that's right. You know, like right. like you know, you can imagine you can imagine two like really opposed sentences like like totally totally legit like like it wouldn't be out of place to hear for the good of the american family we need to uh, curb access to firearms right right, right. Mm-hmm. for the good of the american family we need to expand access to firearms right so right. like like you can you can you can hear you can just yeah so the family thing i i, I totally yeah i totally, totally agree with you absolutely right. ideological right. like right. like even even in the one even in the statement that we would agree with it's still what you see is like this still the it's ideological functioning, functioning, functioning of it yeah. yeah 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 so i think that's pretty good about uh uh yeah com- about uh about to, <laughs> about tony tony soprano and succession and and uh and, and walt i mean like and as i think um probably breaking bad was the or at least succession hasn't ended yet and you and i are not caught up so we don't know how this gets articulated quite exactly right, so but, don't send us an email saying oh i loved this last episode yeah it's great because the family thing really got blown up when this happened yeah, lo- yeah, like yeah. don't don't, please don't do, don't do this yeah. um but like walt has the line right the when he eventually meets up with skylar at the end that like he didn't do it for family he did it for me he liked yeah it. like he yeah. says i liked it i was good at it yeah. and i don't know that um I think that it's depending on how you read the end of Sopranos, it's possible that Tony dies thinking he did it for his family. So I think that's right. I think yeah. that's right. Yeah. I don't so, think he has a similar moment of revelation. Yeah. But I think yeah. there's, so, I think that so it's actually, us because that is a, cause sorry to, sorry to interrupt, but no, that's all right. that, that is the like, that is the thing with that, with that show is that like, it's meant to be, I, I know David Chase has said this before. Like, like he, he definitely thought, think, thought about like a Greek, uh, tragedy in new jersey with a mafia family right. and like that is this like the sophoclean irony like it's not a it's it's not a a, a deficit in the show that tony never has that revelation about himself because right. we right. have that revelation as the audience right. in, in fact i think it's a I, I would even argue it's a kind of weakness of breaking bad that that walt mm. comes to too much awareness at the end and and even his yeah. final act is way too heroic for my taste. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I agree. I know. Yeah. You and I, uh, we were, yeah. we were simpatico on that for sure. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, I think we've come to a little bit of a conclusion here. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Cause Todd, Todd's double parked. So he's got to, uh, he's, he's got to go. <laughs> the, um, so the, the, the thing, the thing about the bottle episode is that, uh, across all of its, uh, varied iterations of appearances, what you get is this, uh, this this concrete form that um, forces characters in a in a ringer to be confronted with their own internal oppositions, and what has to happen is that they have to see that the the, the oppositions are appositions that they are uh, that they, that they are together. They have to be brought through uh, to understand the um, the interdependence of the the internal opposition of itself. And this is the way that like, this is, this is how everyone gets out of the bottle is it's, it's not, it's not, they're not released by time because if it was time, if time was going to release the bottle or the destination in the car ride, then you don't have to come to any recognition of any kind, you know, but it's because the bottling is not physical. It's, 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 it's not, uh, and it's not, completely temporal but it is existential that it puts this pressure on what we would say i think I, you and i would say is the impossible needs to emerge and the impossible being the uh like a reconciliation with contradiction and what's that like i mean i just think there's not a better example than that community episode that uh you're you know you're if we become accepting of our each other's flaws and virtues and it's just one thing it's right. not flaws and virtues it's you know, like, and then there's, there's another thing. Oh, well, your virtue is this and your flaw is that. So work on the flaw and increase your virtue. No, 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 no. It's the same thing. That's the, like the, like the core existential, uh, uh, conundrum. That's the, the contradiction that gets deepened, um, in, I think all of these episodes leading to, and it's always a different kind of impossibility that emerges in the, the, you know, in, in international assassin in, uh, once more with feeling in hush. Uh, in you know in uh, in a long long time in in 
uh, Star Trek in Pine Barrens. Like there's a different kind of impossibility that emerges. This this conclusion, this insight that we come to because of this bottled confinement that could not have been uh, broached or come to without having to to see the intractability of this internal opposition. That's what we get with uh, with the with the bottle episode and why I think that it's like this this most like theoretical um, form in like like that is unique to TV. It, it's not it's not imported from other uh, you know genres. It's not from film. It's not from the 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 stage. Uh, it is from this demand, this economic demand, and it produces uh, like you know an aesthetic. Like, like, you know, we didn't talk about this, but in, um, I think it's, a I think it's Tholian Webb that, you know, that, uh, Kirk and, um, McCoy and Spock go to this other ship. They get beamed onto this other ship to see what happened. And they don't, ha- obviously they can't make another ship. So the, it's just, they get beamed to the set of the Enterprise, but the camera angles are different. It's actually a violation of the 180 degree rule and it's camera and it's angles on the the ship's bridge that you don't really get on the uh, on the Enterprise, and also it's tinted blue, so there's that thing. But there's like um, th- that sort of aesthetic uh, consideration, like only came through because of the economic thing. But it's like that's that's the way this works. That you have this like this economic uh, pressure to develop an aesthetic uh, response uh, f- to, to for to to the issue, and that's why I think like it's this like the really amazing thing is that like what is happening, like for the, the, the thing that is taking place for the episode to even be an episode, which is navigating this like crunch of, uh, of, 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 uh, economic threat that grappling with, uh, with contradiction gets played out in the episodes themselves. So it's, it's, um, I don't, I don't know that people who make the episodes necessarily think about it that way, but you, I just think it's like, available to to see this uh this like meta reflexivity in it and i think that's why uh people um get invested in them and 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 why these these episodes um often like overwhelm our memory of the rest of the show this is this is Catherine van arendach's point about the episode itself that i as a form that i that i really really agree with and like i quote in the uh in the article that like we, when you think about a show the the form of the episode is uh, often looms larger than the entirety of the text itself so we, you remember like your favorite episode uh, more than you necessarily remember like the uh, the text as a whole as a chunk, and the bottle episode I think looms the largest out of all these uh, discrete units of it, and um, pushes uh, pushes an understanding of character and the world um, as it pushes its characters like with and against each other. Good ending point. <laughs> Thanks, babe. So I'll talk to you soon on our podcast. And I just want to say um, at the end here, uh, just a thank you to um, uh, students at uh, of, of three places, uh, Clark University, uh, University of Rhode Island, and Pomona College, with whom I could not have uh, written this. So uh, very much uh, appreciate uh, the, every, everybody for um, helping me to be able to put this out in the world. And I hope that uh, those of us listening uh, to it on a, as a podcast on the new review of film and television studies channel. Uh, maybe the first time you've heard Todd and I talk to each other, maybe be interested to check out uh, why theory, but you really, really don't have to thank you for listening to us about this. I, I, ho- I hope, I uh, hope it's been illuminating uh, conversation uh, at least in part. And uh, yeah, Todd, thanks for, uh, for having the conversation with me uh, in sure. the first place. Of course.